Our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer McCormick. Over the course of nearly two decades, Dr. McCormick has served at every level of the traditional public education system. Starting in the classroom as a special education teacher and later as a middle school language arts teacher, Dr. McCormick became the principal of Yorktown Elementary School and she went on to become the assistant superintendent of Yorktown Community Schools from 2007 to 2010 before she was elevated to the superintendent in 2010. Dr. McCormick serves as the secretary of the board for Ivy Tech East Central Region and has been appointed as an e-learning leadership cadre member by the Indiana Department of Education. She is also on the board of the Indiana Association of School Business Officials and Delaware County Youth Salutes. Dr. McCormick's work as an education innovator was recognized nationally in 2014 when she was invited to the White House to participate in the National Connected Superintendent Summit. She is the recipient of the Outstanding Contributor to Education Award from the Muncie, Delaware County Chamber of Commerce and was named Person of the Year by the Yorktown Chamber of Commerce in 2013. Dr. McCormick earned her doctorate in educational leadership from Indiana State University in 2011. She received her education specialist and licensure as school superintendent from Indiana State University in 2019, 2009, and her licensure in educational leadership and administration from Ball State University in 2004. Dr. McCormick also obtained a Master of Arts in Special Education from Ball State University in 1999 and a Bachelor of Arts in Elementary Education from Purdue University in 1993. Dr. McCormick now resides in Muncie with her husband Trent, a teacher of environmental science at Yorktown High School, who has served as head wrestling coach since 1989 and is past president of the Indiana High School Wrestling Coaches Association. They have one son, Kyle, who graduated from Yorktown High School and is attending the United States Military Academy at West Point. To learn more about Dr. Jennifer McCormick and her campaign, please visit the uh, site at www.jennifermccormick.org or you can follow her on Dr. Jennifer McCormick or on Facebook or on Twitter as well, Dr. Jennifer McCormick. Wow, that light is bright. I know someone mentioned that yesterday, and you are correct. So thank you, and I appreciate the invite to come today. I know many of you are thinking, who is this lady and why is she running? So hopefully when you leave today, you have a better understanding of that. So thanks to the Superintendents Association, the School Boards Association. It's also great to see Denny and Todd in the audience representing the principals and the school um, business officials. You know, it's been quite a ride the last nine months, but what I will tell you is I've been at education for 20 years in public education. Despite what you read on social media, Yorktown is public, so get that out of the way now. And I'm also well aware of this is the second day of our conference, and I've been in your seats for about 10 years. So I know the second day of the conference while you're eating, it's been a long two days. And so if I can just have your attention for a few minutes, some of you arrived here on Sunday, some of you have had some late nights, whether that was by peer pressure or not. Um, so I know how difficult to keep your attention right now is going to be, so I'm going to give it a shot. So basically, I want to just go through what I'm about. And the only reason I'm running is because our Department of Education deserves to be the best in the nation. We deserve that. Our students and educators deserve our Department of Education to be the best. I would suggest we lack leadership and vision at the department right now. And when you have that, things become very disorganized and disconnected from all of us. That is not a good place for us to be. I hear imagine 2020, I, we're trying to survive 2016. So I tell you, as a superintendent, I know your struggles, I know how hard you work, and I know where we all wanna be. In my Indiana lesson plan that I rolled out last week, we went over our non-negotiables and our objectives for the state. My non-negotiables are clear. It is important we have K-12 leadership at the department, someone who understands the classroom, the building level, and the superintendency. So when they make those decisions, they under, in, understand the impact being made. Also, so, someone who understands the importance of streamlined communications. Many of us are struggling in the communication area. We get it a lot of different ways. It's very splintered. Sometimes it's not timely. It is very difficult to manage our operations locally when the state is having difficulties at the state level. Also, partnerships. We can say what we want to say. I've been across the state of Indiana. Partnerships are severed. 
I will tell you, as a state superintendent, I would be committed to working with the governor, whomever gets elected, whether it's Governor Holcomb or whether it's Governor Gregg, I would be committed to working with that person. The day of our state superintendent not willing to work with our governor must end. And I'm not blaming anyone, because I think it probably does go both ways. But I will tell you, it's a professional responsibility to work with our lawmakers, to work with our local schools. Yes, I will call you back if you call me, and yes, I will return emails. We also need to make sure we're working in partnerships with our non-for-profits and our for-profits, higher education and preschool and every other stakeholder. Many people have told me, Jennifer, if you get into office, we will come back to the table. We have to embrace that and bring them back to the table. Partnerships will be huge. Let's talk about resources and tools. Again, we have to have resources and tools that are timely, meaningful, and manageable to give us critical skill sheets in December after we've watched the it's coming in the fall for several months, and then to find out that those critical skill sheets are not all aligned at all to the assessment scoring is, is not going to work. It causes a lot of problems for many of us. I know Governor Holcomb said he couldn't wait to see the scores that come out this year. Well, I can wait, because I know what those are gonna look like, and many of you also do. So, but a lot of that goes back to we have to have the appropriate resources, we have to have the appropriate tools, and the department can help us with that. I know if you, us as, as, as we as educators, we all know you give us our resources and you give us our tools and we will get the job done. That's who we are, that's how we're made up. But we have to have those that are meaningfully manageable and timely. I cannot get five memos regarding pay for performance distribution and think that's efficient or effective. We have got to have a change in practice in the management styles and administration at the department. Also, we need to pay attention to assessment and accountability. I know we're all nervous about what's happening. It's very disappointing, three meetings, three meetings into a huge committee that I have faith in those committee members, but I would also offer that there's a lack of leadership with that committee. The department should have brought a plan to the table to start that discussion. I don't care who the chair is. It's the Department of Education's responsibility. Start that process. We are so behind. I've called a lot of different states across the, this great nation, and they are moving forward with their plans. They didn't wait on the weeds of ESSA. They moved ahead. We're waiting. So when I have conversations, they all mention you're very behind. I don't agree with putting assessment in teacher evaluations. I think that needs to be pulled out. We have great teachers. One test does not tell all about a performance. I don't agree with one letter grade tells all about a school or a district. We need to have a multifaceted approach to that so we are getting evaluated in several different areas, but make sure it's fair and make sure it's transparent. Not one single educator on the road has said, I hate accountability or I hate assessment. That's not who we are. But when it's not fair and it's not transparent, yeah, it becomes a problem for all of us. So we need to make sure that that is addressed. Again, I have faith in the panel committee members. However, we need to make sure that we have the leadership so coming out of that, at the end of this calendar year, there is a plan. My biggest concern is there will be a plan, and in two years, after poor administration of the plan, we're back having the same conversation. We have to pay attention to the administration of the uh, whatever evaluation we pick, along with the choice of vendor or whatever the selection may be of the assessment. And I'll get into that a little later, I know I will. So the assessment piece we need to pay attention to. Finally, in our non-negotiables, we've talked about students before politics. We've had eight years of putting politics before students. It is time we focus back on students. As a mom and as an educator and as a neighbor of a lot of students, we need to make sure our decisions are student driven. They're not driven by our lawmakers. They're not driven by one single entity of an organization who's running the Department of Education. We need to make sure it's driven by students. That is extremely important. Through all that, we went into our five objectives of what we want to accomplish, paying attention to let the students drive our decisions. The first one is funding. As a super, superintendent, and all of you who are school board members, you understand the power of funding. We can't ignore it. But if you have a state superintendent who doesn't understand it, we've lived that for four years. We have to make sure we're working in great partnerships with every organization because there are a lot of different issues going on with our funding. 
Yes, it needs to be adequate. Yes, it needs to be equitable. But it's not just about tuition support. Anytime we can get a bump in tuition support, we're all very excited about that. But the conversation has to branch out to the complexity index, the CTE, to circuit breaker. If you're not, haven't felt the circuit breaker yet, good for you. But I know I'm at Yorktown and my board's here and, and we feel the circuit breaker. And so it's been difficult for, for us. And then I look at some districts like Franklin Township and I can't imagine. So I know it's been difficult for many, many districts across the state of Indiana. But until that conversation broadens up and broadens out, we're going to still struggle with those, with those type of conversations. I know Denny Costerson does a great job of being a cheerleader for us with our funding. However, he can't do it alone. Now, he probably could because he's Superman, but he, can, he should not have to do it alone. So we need to make sure that we're having those conversations to make sure our funding is adequate and it's funding fairly, or adequate and, and fairly. We also need to make sure that we are concentrating on the assessment and accountability, which again, we'll have a question about later. But in addition to that, when we're talking about assessment, I'm hearing a lot about online, which brings me to our next issue of broadband capacity. Only nine districts in the state right now have met the threshold of the broadband capacity, which is one gigabyte per second per thousand students. Don't ask me to explain that. But that's where we need to be, and only nine districts are there. So it's our time to go to our legislators and say, we know we're taking advantage of E-rate, but we need help. We need $10 million out of the gate. We need to make sure our districts are ready to go if we move in the direction of 100% online versus a mode. Sometimes we get to pick the mode of the test, whether it's paper, pencil, or online. If we're going 100% online, there are some districts, I will tell you, that are in trouble. So we need to make sure we are paying attention to that. We also need to make sure that we are paying attention to the demands of the districts as, fiber, as far as cybersecurity and cyber privacy. If there's a district in here that says, hey, we got that, we're 100% secure and we are on it, good for you. But I would also argue there are a lot of districts across the state of Indiana who would welcome support, who would welcome resources, and would, who, who would welcome the help regarding cybersecurity and cyber, cyber privacy issues. It's a big issue, and many of us are not prepared to the level we should be, and many of us are concerned, but we need help with that. Teacher shortage, big issue as I go across the state of Indiana. First, I have a lot of people who want to argue there really is no teacher shortage. There is, and I would argue it's not coming, and it just didn't get here. We faced it in Delaware County many years ago. So we've been dealing with that issue, like many of you, several, several years ago. First, acknowledging there is a problem, but then also bringing to the forefront pay matters. So to pretend like pay doesn't matter is irresponsible. A lot of our legislators, we have conversations, and a lot of time they're like, teachers just do it because they love it. Teachers love it, but they don't want to live in poverty. Pay matters, and we need to make sure we're having that conversation. The other piece of it is we do need a huge marketing push, and I was glad to hear Superintendent Ritz mention, mention that. But to do that and spend $60,000 at the State Fair on Teacher Day once many schools have already started, to me that's not what we need. We need a huge push in marketing to make sure we are celebrating what we are achieving in our local districts. I know we have good things going in our districts and it's celebrated within all of our um, schools, but that doesn't mean outside of our schools are hearing it. We need to make sure we are marketing it correctly and being a big cheerleader for the state of Indiana to entice people in. We also have to look at scholarships and making sure those are funded. For kids who want to come into the profession, we need to secure those dollars. That is not going to be an easy task. That's going to take a lot of information to our lawmakers to convince them that it's here, pay matters, we need help with this. It's going to take a huge issue. It's not about just STEM teachers. It's not about just special ed teachers. You try to find a Spanish teacher. You try to find an elementary teacher. You try to find, I could go on. There is a shortage, and it's not just about quantity, it's also about quality. So we also need to pay attention to both of those factors. If you have a stack of applicants and your principal comes to you and says, I pick none, that's a problem. And we're at that point a lot of times where they don't want any of the applicants put into the classrooms. So we also need to address how do we get good people in the classroom quickly. Florida. Texas, they have figured it out. They have proven models to get people in the districts and use all of you to help with those models. We're good at training teachers. We do it every day. We do professional development quite well in our, in our field. 
We need to make sure that we look at those proven models to say, how are we going to implement those in Indiana so we can get not just people in classrooms, we need quality people in our classrooms. How are we going to do that? We have to look at those proven models. Sometimes there's not a reason to reinvent the wheel, but the wheel is out there, so we need to start looking at that and reviewing what we can do with that in Indiana. That's going to be critical. Preschool. I am not opposed to universal preschool, regardless of what you read. I am not opposed to it. Here's what I will tell you. I went straight to the preschool folks across the state of Indiana and asked them, what are your thoughts? Because so many times we all complain and said if they would have just asked people in the trenches. So I went to our preschool folks. They're worried about facilities. They're worried about transportation. They're worried about quality teachers. They're worried about certification. They're not opposed to it either. They're opposed to what we're hearing from our state superintendent, roll it out and let's hope for the best. We don't operate like that at the local level, nor should I say think they should operate that at the state level. How is it going to be rolled out? How are we going to fund it? How are we going to maintain that funding? And are we guaranteed it's not going to dip into our K-12 monies? I'm not hearing that guarantee, which makes me really nervous. So I'm hearing, let's go ahead, let's service those at most at risk who are not already being serviced by Head Start special education or quality, day, or quality preschools. Let's get them the services they need. That's a much smaller pocket of student or children to try to service than just roll it out and hope for the best. We all know what happens in Indiana when we roll it out and hope for the best and it implodes. We hear I told you so. We cannot afford an I told you so with preschool. We cannot. So we need to make sure it is done and it is done well. We need to make sure that the preschool folks are brought to the table and they are listened to. I'm not opposed to it. Again, I think it's a lot, great long-term goal, but we have to be smart and we have to make sure that funding is secured. And with that, I'm going to stop and take some questions. Well, I thought maybe you were going to get through all my questions. I, I didn't have to ask you. I didn't know where I was out with time either. <laughs> well, I know you just really addressed uh, uh, the current teacher shortage, so unless you want to add something okay. more to that, okay. let's go on to the next question, which I think is really important for our uh, school corporations and, and leadership out there, and that is your opinion regarding the expansion of charter schools and voucher programs. Right. From the beginning, I have made it clear that I do think there is power in parents being able to select what school their child goes to. I chose for my child to go to Yorktown. Many of you have bought homes or moved for the purpose of selecting the school you wanted your children to go to. I think there's power in that. I'm 15% transfer tuition in Yorktown. We've had some success with that, but I'll be the first one to admit if I get a student and it's not a good fit, let's say they're looking for an ag program, I don't have a great ag pro I don't have an ag program, so I counsel them to where they can find a great ag program. I think there is power into that. What I'm concerned about is the choice scholarship items that are attached to that with our funding. Obviously, my whole background is public education. And I know this is one of those areas that um, with party alignment, people can kind of go in avenues that they want to go. Here's what I will tell you. I am realistic enough to know with some of those items, our lawmakers are, unless we'd had a change in, in our lawmakers, those programs aren't going anywhere. And the state superintendent, even our current one, isn't going to change that. She's not going to stop it. She's not going to expand it. She's not going to maintain it. I agree we need to study it. Absolutely agree that we need to study it to say just to take the information and encourage that study with our lawmakers. Here's what I will say. Knowing the current players, knowing that that's not going to change, my charge is let's appropriate it separately. We go after that angle as far as if you're going to fund it, appropriate it outside of our K-12 dollars. That way those programs, if they want to continue those programs or do what they want to do, those programs are being funded separately. You spoke a minute ago about accountability and assessment and what we'd like for you to do is really kind of lay out for us what you think is the best way to address accountability and assessment in our schools? Yeah. I'm not sure I have the answer for the best way. Here's what I will tell you on my opinion. First of all, I think there should have been a lot of homework done the last three years when we had very poor administration and assessment that wasn't credible. I think that we're in the situation where we're, again, behind when we should have been out front. It shouldn't take the lawmakers to say, you have to do this. We should have been out in front of it. Here's what I will say. It has to take less than 1% of the total instructional time at each grade level because we are assessing way too much. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. Preserve instructional time. I think we need to make sure we continue to have formative assessments that are locally decided and interim assessments that are paid for because that's been really nice. 
but also I think when we decide what that summative evaluation looks like, which is the letter of the law, when we decide what's going to meet the letter of the law for ESSA, we have to be very diligent in making sure we have the capacity of the state to do it. So we're not changing our pathway in another, again, two years. It needs to be short. It needs to be for the purpose of, are they ready for grad the next level toward graduation progress at the high school? Are they, ready for, are they really ready for career and college readiness? It doesn't take a 10-hour exam to do that. I like the track. I know a lot of our high school principals, I've been listening, they like ECAs, they would like those to come back. I also like the track of PSAT, SAT, and I've been very um, public about that. For our K-8, I'm concerned about tying that into our, for many of us who are under NWA, I'm calling that an interim because you give it three times a year, so for the language purposes. I, I understand the point of that because many of us run it and it has been a great tool, including at Yorktown. I have concerns if we tie that into high stakes. But again, that takes on a very different look if you don't have that tied to the teacher evaluation. And, and I mentioned this before, but you know, all of our um, uh, attendees today come from different school settings, urban, suburban, and rural. Mm -hmm. and I think we all as superintendents and school boards just deal constantly with how are we going to provide uh, great educational programs for kids if there's not adequate and equitable funding. Can you address your approach to how you would make the issue of adequacy and equity in funding, mm -hmm. um, at, you know? Available. First, I mean, we have to, it goes back to a lot of partnerships as far as I've had legislators who will listen if we take the information to them, and I know many of you do, but at least they're starting to have that little listening ear that I think they're hungry to start to work with someone. So that partnership's gonna be huge in that area. I also am smart enough to know we have to have Denny Costeras at the table and JT and Brian and Todd, because those conversations are very different. If you're sitting in Randolph County, which I saw, um, Mr. Bowsman here, or if you're sitting in Delaware County, or if you're in the donut, that conversation's very different. So making sure we are looking at that funding formula and working with Senator Kinley, which I've already talked to him, he is aware there are issues. And he's also aware that con that is not just an easy fix, which many of you know that formula is complex. I am very concerned about the funding. Special ed funding, I was a special ed teacher, we need to really look at that, which would help everybody across the state. The complexity index killed a lot of people, including very, a lot of schools up north that we need to make sure we're paying attention to. Our CTE is woefully underfunded. We need to pay attention to that. But it goes back to we cannot ignore the circuit breaker. And I know if you're not feeling that circuit breaker, it becomes a non-issue. You will feel it eventually. But those of us who are, that has got to become a big topic. And I know it is, but we've got to get louder collectively with that. We've got to help these schools who are suffering. When you're paying for your chillers that are broken down out of your general fund, that's impacting your staffing. When I'm replacing my buses out of my general fund, that impacts staffing. So we need to make sure we're looking at the whole picture and making sure we are really trying to dive into what are the issues so we can fix those. We want to thank you, Dr. McCormick, for speaking with us today. and appreciate you being here. I want to use one last comment. I'm sorry. One last comment before I go. I'm probably out of time, but I'm a superintendent, and that's how we roll. But I just want to let you know, for all of you in this room, because there have been many, and I probably won't have this opportunity again, who have been at events, who've given funds, who have sent me emails, text messages, who have asked me to your study councils, who have sponsored your own events, School board members, the same thing. There are a few of you in here that I know have gone out of your way. I just want to thank you. I know this is not a fun thing to do as run for office, believe me. But when I look out and I see a friendly face of a superintendent who maybe I don't even know real well who's in an event to sponsor me, it means a lot. So I just want to thank each of you who have reached out and, and helped in some way, whether that's a huge way or, or just a small text message. I truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you.